we're cognizant of the fact that oftentimes in life, we feel lonely. But we also convince ourselves that we don't actually need people to co complete our loneliness. Since you're standing, we might as well just open a Bible. Um, before we get going, I do want to say, shout out all of our legacy online, our legacy global family. Can we make some noise for all the people that are not in the room? I want to shout out the Avery and Tabby Ford in Houston, Texas. I want to shout out Jerry Hamilton in Walnut Creek, California. That's my dad. He watches church in California. I got my dad watching church. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I, I'm always blown away. Oh, almost forgot. The Stephen and Hannah Langley in Meridian, Idaho. Never been there. Don't plan to. But Legacy's there. Legacy's there. And do me a favor, no matter where you're watching from, will you comment and let us know where you, where, when, no matter when you watch it, just let us know where you're from. Because I'm trying to decipher, the, I, I, I'm trying to know, are these real people or is the creative team just putting the sermons on YouTube on repeat on their homes to make the views go up so they can feel validated about their efforts? I don't know. So it would mean a lot if we could know more about, isn't that crazy? That where you drive 10 minutes to and show up 30 minutes late to, I'm not judging anybody. Other people in other parts of the country, they, they're committed to being a part of this as well. Isn't that awesome what, what God does? Come on, we love you, Legacy family, no matter where you are. Um, okay, we need to go to the Bible because they started my clock already. We're going we're gonna go to chapter, we're going to go to John, the book of John, and... Um, I'm excited because we're starting a new series. We started off the year with what? Rewind? Going back to move forward? And uh, I loved it. It was, it was, I had a lot of fun. Um, I need to give a couple of disclaimers about this new series though. First of all, I am not a kid's pastor. So if you have children in here who you feel have not, uh, are prepared to hear about uh, segs or... Um, or maybe you have a junior hire that doesn't have TikTok. And so I want to encourage you. We have an amazing legacy kids ministry with amazing children's leaders. And we have an amazing legacy junior high ministry happening right now as well. So that's, your, that's my disclaimer. That's your get out of jail card because I don't even know what I'm going to say in these next few minutes. So I just assume everything is appropriate. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say, this is my favorite series. We're starting a new series today called Get Your Ship Together. Yeah. Season two. Yeah. Tell the person next to you, get your ship together. And if they're new, make sure you pronunciate clearly. Enunciate. <laughs> and I had to give another disclaimer because if you walked in and the music was a little bit different, you were expecting like, you know, Bethel and you got boys to men. I want you to know, it was on purpose. We haven't lost our mind. We haven't gave up our salvation. We still are a Bible-believing church. But we encourage people to bring friends to church. So my thought was, well, they're going to be stuck for 30 minutes hearing songs they've never heard before. I should like, we should on-ramp them, you know? So my thought is like, let's, let, let's let them walk in like, oh, okay. And then when they're like, oh, this is a cult, you know? At least, at least, you know, we gave them a, I wanted a safe space. It's not for you, okay? The lobby wasn't for you. Karen, okay? It was for, it was for Jerome who came to church for the first time in six years because somebody told him that this next series was going to be life-changing. So I just want you to be prepared. The next month or whatever we're in for this, it's a party in the front, business in the back, okay? But uh, no, I'm excited. Get your ship together. We're going to be, we're on a speedboat. Like we're, we're going straight in. Last, last year, season one, by the way, if you missed season one, you can't just jump into season two and expect to know. Like, you need to go binge season one at Legacy Church Chandler AZ on YouTube or Legacy Church AZ on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Free plug for the creative team. Try to get their views up so they're not, you know. But binge that so you understand what we're talking about in season two, okay? And if you were a part of season one and you still are struggling in those same relationships, go rewatch it because it's probably user error, not a defective manufacturer issue. But uh, I say that because I'm excited because we're going to be talking about the things that normally I don't think get enough attention 
but everyone goes through, like friendships, like singleness, like God's purpose for everyone isn't to find a spouse. It's to be secure in who he's made. Okay, that's for, that's a later week. You got to come back. My single people, I got you. <laughs> Dating. We call now and swipe right. Because I want you to swipe the right way. That's next week. Matter of fact, I'm excited for next week. And then we're doing another one. Uh, this is the one I've never heard in church before. I'm excited. We're doing one called Cheaters, How to Deal with Infidelity and Unfaithfulness. Oh, I'm telling you, we going all, we getting some ships together on my, no, you know what I mean? Like, we're going in. So every Sunday, you better be at the loading dock because at 8.30 and 10.30, this ship is taking off and I don't want you to get left. But I think it's going to be a life-changing experience because God values relationships and there's a way to do it that is different than what we've experienced in the past that can change our legacies forever. It's going to be good. You coming back next week? There's pressure now. I'm literally, you know what I mean? Like, what are you going to say? No? Okay, okay. I, I said all that, but now we got to go to John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm going to start at verse 7. It says this. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. If you have a Bible, highlight that. I want you to know Jesus, I, I hate when people say, God doesn't want you to be happy, He wants you to be holy. They're not mutually exclusive. He says, I'm telling you these things so that my joy can be in you and that your joy can be complete. So you can stop settling for things that aren't actually satisfying and filling your needs. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. That's another good one to highlight. And this is, my, this is what we're gonna really focus on today. Highlight this, 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. And then this is interesting, verse 16. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Okay, I want to give you one more verse and then I'll pray and then we can sit down and then I'll yell at you. Proverbs 18, 24. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend. How many of you guys want a real friend in 2024? Like I need some... Real friends. But a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Holy Spirit, we did not come here for a religious experience or to go through the motions, God. We need, we need you. We want to be with you. We want to hear what you have to say to us. We want to walk out of here differently than we came. And we're believing that. So soften our hearts, open our minds, remove any distractions or deterrence. God, give me wisdom and clarity. And God, we thank you for meeting us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen, amen. Do me a favor, tell the person next to you the title of my sermon. Say, no new friends. No new friends. No new friends. No new friends. No, no new. Still down with my... I knew y'all wasn't all the way saved. I knew it. I knew it. I'm glad you're here, though. That's why we have Black Street in the lobby, because I knew. I knew. There's this, um, there's this tension, I think, that we live in, in society and humanity, of wanting people in our life, but also not wanting to deal with people in our life. And, and so it comes across as things like, we'll say stuff like, like, like 
the prophet Drake of like, no new friends. Still down with my day ones. And, and, and it's, this, it's this thought process that I'm good off of people that are just going to let me down. I'm good off, you know, I got fake, I don't need fake friends. Or, or it's like, well, I'm just not, I'm just, I just don't do people. I'm not a people person. I'm just an introvert. Like that's a spiritual gift. Like I'm just. <laughs> and, and so the tension is we're, we're cognizant of the fact that oftentimes in life we feel lonely. But we also convince ourselves that we don't actually need people to co- complete our loneliness or to offset our loneliness. And, 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 and here's what I want you to know. Oftentimes, especially if you've lived life, you know, past the sixth grade. And, you know, you remember when you're, like, younger and you're like, we're going to be best friends forever. And that's like that middle school, like, you know, got my, my clique, my crew. And then you get to high school, and then that best friend was talking to the boy that you liked behind your back. And you're like, that's why I don't, she's dead to me. Like, I don't do, you know what I mean? <laughs> And that's just freshman year. Wait till like you really get your heart broke. You know what I mean? And so what, we, what, what I say is like it's natural as we go through life to experience things that cause us to say, you know what, I'm not dealing with that anymore. It's natural for us to go through life and say, well, I tried and it didn't work out. So I'm good. I got me. I'm, by, I'm good by myself. No help. Independent. And that's natural. And I also want to say it's normal, especially if you've been hurt. Especially when you've had the good intentions. Especially when, you know, they were, they were in your wedding. And now they probably won't show up for your funeral. Uh, especially when you spent years and years ignoring that and excusing that and being there for them. And then when you needed them, they weren't, it wasn't reciprocated and you're like well that's why I don't even I just I don't put expectations on people I'm just I'm good all by myself Uh, again I want you to understand that's natural and that's understandable but I also want to remind you what what you or at least a lot of you committed to in the beginning of the year where you said I want to grow deeper in love with Jesus I want to remind you what Jesus said In John 15, where he says, this command I give you, love each other. And there is no greater love than one who would lay down their life for their friends. We have no problem laying down our life for our careers, for our dreams, for our ambitions. But what about laying down our life for people who could actually end up taking advantage of our life, taking our life for granted, not matching that same energy. I think that's actually what Jesus is inviting us. I lied. That's actually what he's commanding us to do. It would have been so much better if it was an invitation. I really wish John 15 was was worded like, hey, consider this. (laughs) What if it works out, you were to try to love the others. And when it's convenient, you give a part of your life to them as well. I would have been like, oh yeah, sign me up, Jack. I could do that. Because I can control that. I can control the output. I can almost control the the input. And and I'd be pretty comfortable. That'd be a pretty safe space to live in. But Jesus, somebody didn't tell Jesus how millennials and Gen Z felt about boundaries. <laughs> because Jesus says, if you love me, if you're my friend, you're going to keep my commands and love others the way I've loved you. And know what I have found to be true about Jesus? He doesn't put boundaries on how much he loves me, he doesn't put prerequisites if I'm good enough for him. He just lays his life out. And then he 
says, if you're going to be my friend, if we're going to actually have a legitimate, authentic, real relationship, then you're going to do the same for others. And so what I want to help us in these next few moments that we have is I want us to do a couple things. First of all, I want us to identify what kind of friend am I? Before I start judging the fake people, and that's why I don't do this, or, you know, girls, that's why I don't mess with girls, I only have guy friends because I can't trust girls, and that's because, well, I don't need nobody, I'm good by myself, you know, ten toes, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> Before we do that and judge people for what they haven't been for us, I want us to first identify who are we. Am I actually following Jesus in this area of my life? Because don't get it twisted. You can get comfortable in isolation and think you're following Jesus, but how can you follow Jesus if there's no others? How are you going to love one another when you do everything by yourself? You've protected yourself, what you think is protecting yourself, but what you've actually done is prevented yourself. So I want us to identify us, but then I also want us to revolutionize who we call friend. And I want us to maybe reevaluate who we call friend and find out how do we set a godly standard so that I'm able to be the friend and surround myself with the type of friends that God wants me to. Y'all down for this? Yeah. We're about to take off. I, I, the captain gave you the, you know the destination. So if this is too much, you're like, oh, I should have just came next week when he was talking about dating and how to find my Boaz or whatever. Right? <laughs> it's too late. Grab the person standing next to you so they can't leave. Like, just hold them. <laughs> Make it awkward. Here, here, here's, here's what I want to start off with when it comes to Jesus. Is first of all, if you've been at Legacy for any sort of time, matter of fact, if you have been to Legacy DNA, make some noise. I've been seeing packed out classrooms. Let's go. Legacy DNA, it's now a two-week class that we take. We invite everyone to go through because it, you learn about who you are, you learn about who we are, and then in week two, you get to find your fit. And so I'm excited for all that God's doing uh, through that Legacy DNA class because we're not just trying to assimilate people into Christianity as like this machine. We're trying to make people feel like individuals and see how has God wired me, how is he connected and, and put inside of me, and how can I use that for his glory and to build his kingdom. And I use legacy DNA as an example because I think the first thing we need to have is the end in mind when it comes to friendships. I think that we need to understand that as followers of Jesus, we need to be committed to engaging in friendships, but specifically in friendships that are legacy-minded, meaning they're not just focused on temporary surface things. Like, just because they're fun to party with does not mean that they make an ideal friend for you. Uh, I want us to be committed to making sure that we're partnering with people in terms of, like, committing to doing life with people that are pushing us into the legacy that God has for us and that are focused on building God's kingdom that allow us to love people, to follow Jesus, and to lead other people into the life that Jesus died for them to have. Or you could say it like we say it. I want people that are going to help me love, live, and lead like Jesus. But I say that because honestly, loving, living, and leading like Jesus, even though that's a focal point for our church, and it's something that we, we strive for, that's the, that's the mission and vision of our church, it's actually secondary to your walk with God. Because God does not want you to become an expert at loving, living, and leading like Jesus. Because here's the truth, you never will be. I don't care how well you think you love people, someone is going to tell you, I just didn't feel appreciated. <laughs> they probably will have your last name. <laughs> <laughs> I feed you, I pay for your private school, I pay for your stupid sports that you suck at. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you never let me do anything. Because I have nothing left to give you, you know? <laughs> You've done everything. So, 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 so you can't make the standard of loving as like the end goal of your life because do you really love enough? 
You can't make living like Jesus the, 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 the only standard for your life because I don't know about you, but my Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. So no matter what I do, you could be the pastor of Legacy Church, you might oversleep on a prayer call <laughs> and feel like a hypocrite. So did that, does, does that disqualify you because you had a day where you weren't living to the expectation you placed on yourself? And then when it comes to leading like Jesus, I mean, well, good luck with that. You can be the greatest leader ever. You can be leading the greatest church in the world that ever existed in the world that God ever thought of. And he, you can name it legacy and people will leave because you weren't deep enough or you weren't whatever enough. And you're like, no, but I was leading like Jesus. And they're like, well, that ain't my Jesus, you know. <laughs> so then were you not good enough? So what am I saying? All those things are good and needed and necessary as long as they come secondary to the first most important thing, which is not loving, living, and leading like Jesus. It is actually being and following Jesus. Being with and following Jesus is actually the most important thing you can do with your life. I don't know about you, but I've reached this point where I want to become a better follower than a leader. Because if I'm super honest, half the time when I'm leading my marriage, my kids, you, I don't know where I'm going. I know I look like I have it all together. I wore a collared shirt today. <laughs> but honestly, I'm leading people, and half the time I don't know where I'm even going. Because I prayed and fasted for 21 days and I didn't get any word. So I'm just, hey, we're just going to keep walking this way. Because <laughs> I said so. Let's go. Let's go. You know. So what I've now done is I've said, you know what? Yes, I'm not trying to uh, avoid responsibilities. I'm not trying to be that person where I protect myself from myself. I'm not trying to make excuses for why I can't or why I won't do certain things because it's just too much. No, no, no. I need the pressure because I don't want to settle. But the peace I have that makes the pressure bearable is that as much pressure and responsibility as I have to be an amazing husband and father and pastor and basketball player in my 30s and up, you know, basketball league. <laughs> I'm giving buckets to 30 year olds right now. You know? <laughs> but it's secondary because at the end of the day, I just want to be a good son that follows Jesus. I just want to learn to follow. And that way, when I don't know where I'm going, I don't have to feel guilty about it because I could be like, I was just following what I thought Jesus was leading me to. And then there's grace for my life. There's peace in my life. I don't have to have all the answers because I'm just trying to be better as a follower. So I wanted to say that to you because really as we're trying to become better at being friends and bringing friends, I think the first thing we gotta do is follow the friend who made himself available. The friend who said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Before we start trying to figure out, well, I need to, well, let me see, is this gonna be my friend? What kind of crazy is you? Oh, oh that's too much. No, 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 no. I want to be the friend. I want to just get following the best friend that ever existed. But let me tell you the truth about following Jesus. Because he says, do as I do. And following Jesus, especially, oh man, Jesus is good. He sets it up very good in the beginning. He's, Jesus is the best preacher ever. He says, do as my command so that your joy may be full. So you're like, oh, and then you can ask whatever you desire from my father and he'll give it to you. So I'm like, Let's go, genie God. I'm with this, you know. So I'm like, this, this, this sounds good because that's John 15. John 15 sounds amazing. It's like, put me through that DNA class. I'll do that. But John 15 happens after John 6. And John 6 is a prerequisite for John 15 because in John 6, he models what it looks like to follow him. Some of us, if we're honest, we follow Jesus because of the promise of a better life and peace and heaven and upgrades. And, and, and I'm not even saying that's bad. Like, I, w I, I think that's, that's okay. But Jesus isn't, Anybody ever been catfished? You know what I'm talking about? We're like, the social media profile was totally different 
from that real life at Applebee's interaction? <laughs> You're like, how did he make himself 6'3"? Oh. And he's like, what kind of filter does she use? <laughs> Jesus isn't like that. Jesus, in John chapter 6, he, he does this thing that is actually necessary for us to be able to trust that we can follow him. He goes through what a lot of us will go through. You remember I said it's natural to put up walls of, of self-preservation and, and, and defense after you've been hurt by someone who you were honest and vulnerable and real with. But the Bible says that Jesus is not some high priest or some ethereal being in the sky who just has good ideas. And he's not like a travel agent Christian. You know what that is? That's the one who's like, oh, you should totally do this and you should totally go there and you should. And it's like, well, what was it like? Well, I haven't been there, but it sounds good. The Bible says, you know. <laughs> Jesus isn't like that. The Bible says we serve one who empathizes with our weaknesses. How does he empathize? Because he was there. He felt it. So check this out in John 6. So in John 6, Jesus is talking to all his friends. And Jesus has lots of, of friends. If we were to do it like how Facebook does it, where anybody that just pushes the button, they're like, they're my friends. I think we're friends on Facebook, you know. Jesus was the original Facebook friend without Facebook. He had hundreds, if not thousands of follower friends. But one point in his life, in John chapter 6, he starts to be honest about what a relationship with him, what a, rela what a relationship with him actually requires. He, he, he does a, a, D, a D, DTR, define the relationship. Have you guys ever had one of those talks where you define what is this, what, what are we actually doing? So Jesus does that. He, he says, this is what it looks like. And he says some uh, pretty interesting things to his friends. He says, hey, if anyone of you want to be my friends, you got to eat my, blood, eat my uh, flesh and drink my blood. And he's talking to people that have a kosher diet. Like day 21 day fast forever, you know. And everybody's like, <laughs> quit playing, Jesus. <laughs> you crazy. And then he doesn't smile. And then so the disciples, the friends, they're like, hey, um, he has like a PR friend who's like, tries to help him reword, you know. <laughs> I think what you meant to say was maybe show up occasionally, but stay connected on social media. He's like, no, no, I said what I said. And then the disciples are like, well, that's a lot to digest. Like, that's just a lot, okay? <laughs> Read your Bible, John chapter 6. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but. And then the Bible says this. These are friends who've been following him for years. The Bible says that after hearing this, majority, many people left him. He had fed thousands of people. He fed them, them their kids. He, he had done miracles. He invested, invested time, energy, resources, done all these things for all these people. And the moment he asked for a commitment of what this friendship is going to require, they're like, I'm busy that day. I'm giving you the day. I'm busy every day, you know. And this is my favorite part of John 6 because it shows the transparency and the realness of Jesus. He turns to the people that are left and he says in John 6, 67, it says, then he turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? That is a profound, deep question. Are you also going to leave? The friend group started in the thousands, minimum the hundreds. He gets real with them about what friendship actually looks like from his perspective. They all walk away except 12. Hey, you need to learn how to love, live, and lead like Jesus. I want you to grow a friend group from thousands to 12. And then he says, are you also going to leave? Now, here's what I believe. I believe a lot of us have been in that same situation as Jesus, where we had some people that we were doing life with, or that we were optimistic about doing life with, or that we finally, you know, felt like we were getting into a groove, and then something happens, and they walked away. And then what we do is we, we don't ask the question to the people that are left, are you also going to leave? We project the answer to everyone else and say, you're probably just going to leave too, so I'm just going to shut down. And know it's interesting, the Bible says in John 10, 10, it says a thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. What does he try to steal, kill, and destroy? He tries to steal the opportunity for you to become who God wants you to become. 
He tries to kill any hope for your future. And he tries to destroy, as soon as you think about rebuilding that, they're just going to leave you anyway. So this is what it looks like in real life. There's a part of me that knows I need, it's not enough just to, you know, think about God, or it's not enough to just hear a sermon online. I, need, I think I need to show up to a church. I'm going to show up to a church. I'm going to show up to a church. I might, I might show up to Legacy. You know, I'm going to go to Legacy Church. They got the little cool stuff on Instagram. Okay, I'm going to show up to Legacy Church. I go to Legacy Church. But I don't want to really talk to nobody. I'm just here for God. You could have got God on YouTube at Legacy Church Chandler AZ. You know what I mean? Like, you showed up because your soul said, I need community. But your mind said, the last time I was in a community, I got hurt. So I'm going to show up maybe for a year before I ever even think about, you know, I have those greeters that, you know, I got the first, you got that buff kid in the parking lot that's like doing a little thing. <laughs> Anybody ever seen him? Yeah. Yeah. And then you come up to the door and it's like, hi, welcome to Legacy. You're like, oh my gosh, why are they talking to me? <laughs> I just want to get this donut and they give out these donuts for free? Oh, come on. Hey, you take one too. <laughs> and, th- and then... I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just sit in the back. I don't need nobody seeing me. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just sit in the bleachers. They got bleachers section. Oh, they got bleachers. I don't even have to be no. Now I know you guys came because you're Christians. You let everybody else get the comfortable chairs. I know. I'm not judging you. But there's some of you. You're like, I'm gonna just hide right here. And you'll be in a part of a community for a year, but you're actually apart from the community for the year. Because you were scared to really let your your guard down. Because you already told yourself, well, the last time I was in the church, I got hurt. The last time in a church they said, hey, we love you, your family. And no one ever really took time to know me. Or I did something that was frowned upon and I got rejected. Or I stopped going for a little bit and nobody cared. And so you rob yourself of asking the question, because the question is not wrong. Are you also going to leave? That was Jesus being honest that rejection is a reality. Matter of fact, write that down. In relationships, rejection is a reality. The most encouraging thing I can tell you for 2024 when it comes to friendships, expect to get rejected. For real. Do you know how many people I've discipled and done life with and poured into and prayed for them and done this with them and then something happens and, you know, maybe I left the church or the organization, whatever, and I don't even get an invite to the wedding. I'm like, I hooked y'all up. Y'all didn't even know each other until I can't even get the, I wasn't going to go, but I can't get the invite, you know? You ever had one of those? I just wanted the invite. I just wanted to know you cared. Like, you know, I had plans that day, even though I don't know what day it is, but I just wanted to know I was thought of, you know? And so what we do is we allow that situation of rejection to stop us from ever opening up and being vulnerable again. Because now we've projected that our past experience is our future destiny. And so when Jesus says, are you going to leave? He's acknowledging the reality of rejection of like, I just spent so much time and so much energy doing all this for people and they all left. And I'm going to be real. Are y'all going to leave too? But here's what I love about Jesus that I want us to catch as well. There's nothing wrong with asking the question. Just be sure that you wait long enough to hear a response. Because the response is amazing. Peter, he says this. He says, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. You know what he did? He knew that Jesus had just experienced real rejection And know what Peter did? He reaffirmed Jesus that I'm still with you. Some of us are so focused on the hundreds that have left that we don't appreciate the 12 that have remained. And we haven't even given them a full opportunity to love us and support us because we've we've been present physically, but not emotionally, not relationally. We've just been sitting in the seats. And so if we're going to grow deeper in love with Jesus this year, I want us to acknowledge and be real about the fact that rejection is a part of relationships. 
but I'm not defined by my rejection. I'm not going to allow one rejection uh, from, the, from what happened in relationships. I'm not going to let the devil steal with the future relationships that God has for me. I'm not going to let him kill my optimism and my hope for the future that there are still some real friends that are really going to love me and support me and stand by me. I'm not going to allow what happened in the past to destroy what God wants to do in my future with more people because God designed me to be in community. In the very beginning, he said, it's not good that man is alone. And so Jesus stays long enough. He's real. But he's also patient and open enough to allow people to stay. Even though he's been rejected, he gives another chance. And I just wonder if that's where you're at, where you just really haven't given the other people, the others, another chance to love you. Here, here's the next thing. I want to talk about the requirements for real friendships. Everybody say real friendships. Matter of fact, you might have to edit that slide. Because that says friendships, but Proverbs 18 says there are friends who destroy each other, but real friends, there are real friends who stick closer than brothers. So here's the requirements for real friendships. Um, number one, why don't we start with that? Let's be real. Everybody say real. You know what all the people say? I just don't like fake people. I just, I just don't do fake people. Oh crap, I got four of them pointing back at me. I'm the fake one. Let me, let, me, let me define to you what a fake friendship looks like. Oh yeah, I'll go party with you. Hey, how, how, how's work going? Hey, how about those sons, huh? Billion dollar roster, can't get out the eighth seed, huh? <laughs> Surface, easy. Not actually being vulnerable enough to be hurt, but being transactional enough to be like, well, yeah, I have a relationship with so-and-so. That's, that's not what Jesus models. Jesus is saying we need real friendships. We need real conversations of, are you, are you going to leave me too? Because everyone else left. So, 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 so first we have to be, stop expecting other people to be something that you're not. You have to lead that way. You have to start that. You have to set that standard. Here's uh, Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to jump ahead. It says this. When Jesus came to the region, the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, this is interesting. How many of you guys have ever, are, you're the people like, I don't really care what people think. I'm going to be me. Like, I'm not really, I don't really care. Oh, no one wants to raise their hand. Okay. Thanks for being real. Gosh, I wish I didn't have a fake church. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so we have this tendency to tell ourselves that other people's opinions don't matter. And to a degree, I get it. I agree. To a degree, I agree. Like if God's told you to do something, you got to do it, regardless of who is for it or against, like you got to do it. But I also believe in this thing called self-awareness. And self-awareness is not who you think you are. Self-awareness is being aware of what your self does to others. And so Jesus starts off with, hey, what's the word on the streets about me? Who do the people say I really am? Because he wants to know. I mean, I'm out here doing miracles. I'm out here raising the dead. I'm out here walking on water. What are they saying? And so the people tell, people tell him, his friends, his real friends, tell him. Yeah, they're out there. They're thinking you, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, or Elijah, or John the Baptist. Jesus didn't even baptize people. He let his friends baptize people. But anyway. And so he goes, okay. So that's what everyone else thinks. Okay. Well, maybe I can work to do some things that kind of differentiate me from maybe, you know. But then he says, and this is a, even a better question. He says, but who do you say I am? It's easy for us to brush off, you know, the opinions of our supervisors or, you know, our exes or the people that, you know, the fake friends, it's easy for our critics, whatever. It's easy to brush those off because they don't know me. They don't know what they're talking about. But have you ever been real enough and vulnerable enough to ask the people around you, who, who do you really think I am? Who, how does my behavior, what are my actions like? Who, who do you really, how do you really see me? You know what a vulnerable question is? How can I get better as a friend? What's something about me that I won't like to hear but I need to know? 
When's the last time you asked your friend that? Not, hey, so how should I play this parlay? What's the money line on you? What about, hey, tell me something I suck at as a human being. That's crazy. I never thought you'd ask. Um, You know? (laughs) But but can we be honest? That's that's real. But a lot of us have never had those conversations with our friends. We spend our time with our friends talking about other fake people and everybody else's problems. And what if you rearrange that energy to just figure out how can I be better as a person? And if they like, nothing, you're great. You need better friends. Because that shows they don't really know you. So maybe actually you need to be a better friend. Because if they only know you from, oh yeah, we go clubbing together every weekend. Or, oh yeah, I sit next to them at the 1030. And, oh yeah, we just, we serve with each other. But they don't know your struggles. They've never seen you flare up with your kids or with your spouse or your significant other. They, they've, you've never been honest about the things you're insecure about. Then how can they know you? And so Jesus, to the people that really know him, he says, so who do you say that I am? He's real. And then he got, he got a real one. He got Peter. And Peter, you know, Peter keeps it a hundred. And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You know what, you know what Peter just did? He reaffirmed Jesus. Peter's like, look, and I don't care about those 300 people that left us. They was fake anyway. You are the Messiah. Your words are the words of life. You are, you're a better leader than you think you are. You're a better husband than you think you are. You're a better business owner than you, you're a better employee than you think you are. I know you didn't get that promotion. They didn't give you a raise in six years. You've been working your butt off. Forget them. You are him. Peter, how do you reaffirm Jesus? My goodness. And you know Jesus was fired up because then this is what Jesus says. Jesus is like, you are blessed. You got a blessing just for reaffirming Jesus. (laughs) Some of y'all don't get blessed because you never shout Jesus out. Jesus be like, well, they don't really appreciate nothing. So I'm going to let them do. You're like, nah, Jesus, you are the king of glory. He says, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say that you are Peter. Now he start preaching at him. He's like, he got the organ. Where my organ at? You are Peter. Because he was Simon. He's like, which means rock, rock solid, day one, Dwayne Johnson. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Yeah. Can you imagine Jesus just Tony Robbins in you and just. Van, for real, come on out. We got to land this. So, so I want you to write this. This is, this is what friendship looks like. It's realness. It's vulnerability. But then know what it is? It's this, how did I say it? I kept them all R's because I wanted to stay on track. It's reinforcement. You need friends that reinforce the truth of how God sees you, how God views you, and what God says about you. You need friends that don't reinforce your fears or your insecurities. They'll be real with you, but as soon as they're real with you, they reinforce. But this is what God says. Yeah, you made some dumb decisions last year with messing with so-and-so because you're better than him. You don't need him, and he don't deserve you. This year, we leveling up, boo-boo. Hey, bro, you, I know you spend way too much money at strip clubs for people that don't even really want you, and you over there, you need to get to church. We got some fine Christian women that love God, that have boundaries, that are way better, and then they're, and you know what I mean? They're expensive, don't get me wrong. You know, they got standards, and you need a job. Yeah. Too much, too much. Too. I felt like Jesus, I was just like, on, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. You know. But do you have friends that reinforce how God views you? And if the answer is no, maybe because you haven't surrounded yourself and allowed yourself because you didn't have that. Think about this. Think about this. Because that's Matthew, uh, what chapter is that? Matthew 16? I love you, babe. (laughs) Jesus never gets Matthew 16 if he writes Peter off in John 6. If Jesus says, everyone else left and you're probably going to leave too, he never gets the opportunity for Peter to say, no, you are the Messiah. He never gets reinforced if he rejects him in the beginning once it got hard and everybody else left. What if God brought you to Legacy Church not for you to hear amazing sermons from the best dressed pastor that ever lived? Her name's Delicia Hamilton. (laughs) Come on. Humble, 2024. Come on. What if your miracle is in the person next to you? 
What if the miracle is the fact that you get a person that you can text? Because I'm not giving all y'all my number. Y'all are crazy. <laughs> but the person next to you, what if you have someone that can reinforce what you hear from a microphone and they can say it better in a text when you're not feeling it? When you're, when you're starting to believe the lies of the enemy, you have someone that says, no, 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 no. I know you were struggling in that area, but hey, that was last year you. And even though it comes up again, we're going to rebuke that thing. You need people that can reinforce. You need a Peter. Tell the person next to you, are you my Peter? Everybody fired up? Everybody ready to get some friends? Then we got to keep reading Matthew 16. Worship team, where are y'all? I've been trying to land this and y'all not helping me. So let's keep reading. Because after Jesus gives this little super fiery Tony Robbins sermon to Peter, then verse 21 happens. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. Matter of fact, he would be killed. But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. But Peter, everybody say, but Peter. Oh, Jesus, you all need a Peter. But let me tell you the problem with Peter. Verse 22, but Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. He's trying to protect his friend. I can relate to that. I can appreciate that. Jesus turned to Peter. You know, it's, <laughs> that's a, you got to pay attention to the Bible. Like Jesus turned to Peter, like gave him his full attention and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing... How did bread go from being the rock of the church to Satan in one conversation? In one conversation. <laughs> you are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Wait a minute. You paid, Jesus just said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my heavenly father, you got God in you. You're the church. And, you are my, and then two minutes later, Get behind me, Satan. You are. So here's what's important. This is, remember, we're talking about, everybody say real friendships. Because this is what a lot of us would have done. The moment we tried to do the right thing by somebody and they rebuked us or distant or, you know, challenged us, checked us, corrected it, whatever you want to call it, we would have shut down like, oh, well, see, okay, fine. Well, I'm, who you calling devil? Okay. And this is what we would have done. We'd have, we would have rejected the rebuke and we would have said, okay, they're a hater. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm good. I'm good. But a real friendship, not only is it real in terms of vulnerability and authenticity, not only does it have reinforcements of reminding us who God sees us as, but it also has to leave room for rebuke. Is there any person in your life that can be like, hey, I know you love Jesus, but you're acting like the devil right now? Or is that, oh, they were just, they were just, they didn't understand me. They weren't there for me. How many of you guys, I'm trying to make sure I say this without being judgmental. How many of you guys don't like overly critical people? You're just like, I'm not really into like overly critical people, okay? How many of you guys prefer constructive criticism? Like you're like, I can listen to construct. How many of you guys are like, I don't like critics, I like constructive criticism. Agree? Okay, about 80% of us, other 50% or whatever that number is, didn't want to vote. It's all good. That's why. All right. <laughs> I'm learning restraint. So, 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 so check this out, check this out, check this out. What if criticism is just criticism you have to choose how to construct it for your benefit. What if there's no such thing as constructive criticism? It's just, what will you do with it to construct who God wants you to be? I welcome all criticism at this point. I used to be like the people who didn't vote. I'd be like, oh, they're being a hater. They're just a hater. You know who we often do it to? The people closest to us. Oh, my wife just is tripping. She just doesn't understand. She just, because she didn't say it nicely. She didn't give me a massage before she actually verbally abused me, you know. 
oh, my boss is just too hard on me. They just, they just expect too much here. No, maybe they see more in you than you see in yourself. What if Peter would have been like, you calling me Satan? Get behind you? Get behind you? I thought we were friends. I thought I was walking with you. Now I'm supposed to get behind you? And what if he walked away? What is my point with that? Is that I think that we have to do a better job in our friendships of inviting and allowing rebuke to come without us becoming defensive or justifying it. You know what Peter didn't say? Well, I was trying to help you. You don't want to talk about you about to get beaten, and died. I was trying to protect you. You know what Jesus said, which was also very real and vulnerable, and I never caught it till recently? Jesus said, you're a dangerous trap to me. He wasn't demonizing Peter. He was actually affirming how much his opinion mattered to Jesus. And he's saying, if I listen to you right now, I will stop from becoming and doing what God has called me to do. What if the thing you think is overly critical or too hard or too much is just God rebuking you from having some thoughts that are just from a human point of view and he's called you to live and think supernaturally. All rebuke and rejection isn't bad. It's based on how you construct it for God's glory and your best good. And it, you know what's gonna suck? Is if every Peter or every Jesus that God places in your life, you write them off because you didn't like, you didn't like the packaging. So it's not shown in this passage, but we see it in life. What, happen, what needs to happen after realness and after, I'm sorry, after rebuke, there needs to be repentance. When's the last time you apologized to a friend? When's the last time you said, hey, you know what? I, I think I could have handled that situation better. Or do you just say, well, I'm just done talking with them. Or when, when they're ready, they'll, they'll reach out. I thought you were supposed to love, live, lead like Jesus. I thought you were... You know what Jesus doesn't do? Well, when you're ready, you'll reach out. You know what the Bible says? He says he stands at your door and knocks. You showed up today, not because you chose Jesus, because Jesus chose you. Because he's been knocking and asking you to grow in the relationship and the friendship. And he woke you up and drugged your lazy butt to church just so he could remind you and reinforce how much he loves you. And it might sound like rebuke at times, but it's not to push you away. It's actually, he says, get behind me. Why? He wants Peter to start following him again because Peter got out of alignment. That's the last R I got for you. A real friendship will result in realignment. Realignment. What does that look like? True story. I did this this year. I called a bunch of my friends and I said, hey, um, I want to be honest. This is... I was hurt or disappointed in some things that happened this past year. I just want to know, are we, where are we right now? So I can have realistic expectations of you. Maybe I'm projecting an expectation of you that's not fair just based on what it's been back in the day. What if you're not giving your friends opportunities to grow? What if your friends have outgrown you? What if you have some growing to do? So I had conversations with my friends like, hey, what, what's the expectation for this year? What are, we, what, are we, what are we doing? How are we doing it this year? How, how can I be better? Here's what I'm asking. Here's what I'm needing. Is that too much? It's, it's almost like the, are you going to leave too? But it's not a fear of, are you going to leave? It's, hey, are we still in alignment on the same thing? Or in the, in the journey of our friendship, do we need to re, re, recalibrate, readjust? Here's the uh, three questions I wanna give you to ask your real friends. Number one, what is something about myself that I need to know even if I won't like it? You might wanna take a picture of this and just send it to somebody because you don't have the, it's, it'd be tough to text it. Just send them the picture. What's something that I need to know? The, the next question is, how can I be a better friend to you this year? 
Let's stop assuming that just because we intend to do good, just because we're trying to protect people, just because we're saying, hey, that'll never happen to you. Let's not fool ourselves and not believe that we're not actually a trap, that we're actually not a hindrance at times, that we actually can't grow and be better. And then here's the third one. What is an area of personal growth that I can help hold you accountable to this year? Help me help you. I don't wanna have another year where at the end of it, we're still complaining about fake people. We're still too broke to go on vacation together. We're still complaining about our baby daddy issues. Like I wanna grow and hold each other accountable to where this is a legacy focused, kingdom minded friendship to where God can say on these rocks, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because where two or three are gathered together, a triple braided cord is not easily broken. We can fight for each other. We can defend each other. We can reinforce each other. Like that's what I want this year but I have to set that standard. I have to give that opportunity. Here, here's what I don't want for us as, as a church. You know, I'm a, this is a true story. A couple weeks ago, I saw this, I saw this thing on, on a video and it, uh, it was like at a church and they had cards for like first time guests. And it said, can we be friends? Like instead of like connect card, it was like, can we be friends? And I was like, hey, we should do that. And, and your pastor is like, we are not that church yet. Our people are not that friendly yet. I was like, but we can, we, can, we can get there. And what she was saying is, we have to work intentionally to create a culture where we don't just show up to church, but we become the church. Where we're actually engaging and asking real questions to people that are next to us. And they're not just, oh yeah, I've seen you before. It's like, no, I wanna know your name. I'm not gonna wait for someone to come up to me. I'm gonna take the initiative. So can we, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, prove my wife wrong this year. Let's be the people that we can put on the little cards. Can we be best friends? Here's the last thing I'm gonna say. Can I get those real quick? Donnie, come here real quick. I want us to understand that as easy and as comfortable as it is to do life alone for a lot of us, because we don't have to worry about meeting someone as us. I don't, you know, because you recognize when you get into a relationship, you got to choose the crazy. Like all of us are to some levels, you know, some more than others, but all of us. <laughs> and so it's a conscious effort, but, but, but here's the thing. Don't let the enemy rob you of the blessing and the gift of friendship because of what others have done. Put up John 15 one more time. There is no greater love than this. Because honestly, I could do what I want, when I want, by rowing by myself. I can go faster by myself, but I can go farther with someone rowing with me. And rowing with me, sometimes it looks like this, but sometimes, you know what I have to deal with? Somebody being like, hey bro, you could have did better. <laughs> Did I break it? It might be some broke feelings. It might cost me some money. I'll use anything to keep a sermon going. But, but at the end of the day, you know what I have to remind myself? Grow up, people, okay? And I had to do it because he would hit me a lot harder, so I had to be the one. But, but here, hear my heart, hear my heart. At the end of the day, whether it feels like that, whether, it, whether there's days where we're doing this, like, I didn't agree with that, and who you calling the devil, and you ain't even, you know what I mean? Like, I still need it. Think about, Jesus said, you're a dangerous trap to me, not because you're the devil for real, but because I love you so much, and I'm, I'm so, I need you so much, that I need you to push me when I'm saying, this is what I feel like God is calling me to do. Hey, that seems a little excessive. It really don't take all that. Why, I mean, you parent, like, I don't know if you're, you, that seems a little overbearing for the kids, like, no one, but God's telling me I need to raise my kids differently than what I've seen my parents do or what culture is doing or what's popular. And so I don't care if my kid's 15, he ain't having social media because it's not feeding his soul. He can have the Bible app, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like, what if God calls you to do something differently? You need to be able to walk and have people that say, I'm going to reaffirm what God's saying, regardless of what my humanistic view is. Regardless of how I would have voted, regardless of what I would have done. I need people that say, but I believe what God has on your life is worth it. And that allows me to keep rowing and growing and learning, oh, 
then I'm able to love what, do what Jesus says, lay down my life for my friend. But it hurt, yeah, that's, called, that's what dying does. It hurts. It's the opportunity for him to hurt me, but it's also the opportunity for him to love me and help me grow and to become more like Jesus. Thanks for watching today. If you enjoyed today's message, go ahead and hit the thumbs up below and share with a friend. Here at Legacy, prayer is our priority. So let us know how we can be praying for you by emailing prayer at legacyaz.church. If you'd like to partner with Legacy, you can donate any dollar amount to the number 84321 or download the church app. You can also go to our website, legacyaz.church and click on ways to give. You'll see links to support Legacy Church. Thanks for watching and don't forget to love, live and lead like Jesus. Thank you.